Okay, welcome everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so happy that we have a lot of our students here this evening for their favorite fan. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce to you Alex Allen, who is going to talk to you about her really, really inspiring and wonderful story about how she got to be who she is, and I will tell you, she is just a dynamic, really inspiring individual herself, and she's affirming that right now, <laughs> but it's really, really true, and she does tremendous work with our Voices of Excellence kids at the high school, and um, she has her own website, Her Worthy Lifestyle, she's going to talk about the work that she does, and I'm just... But so thrilled Thank you that so you much. accepted my invitation to come this evening and share your story with all of us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for taking out your time to come see me and just listen a little bit to my story and what I've created Worthy Lifestyle. We are going to start out with a little experiment called the school bus exercise. I need seven volunteers. <laughs> First seven students that raise their hand. <laughs> seven, uh, stand up. Alright. Dania, you are going to be the bus driver. So I'm gonna need you to just sit right here. I need the rest of you guys to just form two lines, three people in each line right here. <laughs> Two lines, three people in each line. Oh, I know. Yeah. Sorry. I know. No, you fine. Everybody take a car. Bear with me, everybody in the audience. Five, six. There you go. So the job is, you, you guys' job is to, in your regular tone, everybody just stay with on your part for a minute straight. And I'm going to set a timer. So I'll let you know when to start. And then Dania's job is to pay attention to what I'm saying. I'm going to be over in this corner. So Dania's job is, while all this is going on, she's going to try to pay attention to what I'm saying. Okay. So you guys can start right now. Okay, everybody can stop. Donia, how easy was it for you to hear me? I feel really good. Oh, Were you getting frustrated? It's a little bit. So, I'm like, what she said. so this example was basically what my mind was like when I was going throughout school, because everything that I was going through. I need each of you to read off so everybody in the audience can really hear what you guys were saying. You can start. I wonder if my mom and dad are going to be fighting when I get home. I hate my Anxiety. I hope Sarah doesn't make fun of me today. I'm hungry. Okay, you guys can sit down. Thank you so much. So the point of that exercise was for you guys to really see how my mind and a traumatized student's mind might be functioning when you're trying to give them basic instructions. They've got 75 things on their mind. And we're trying to tell many adults to be able to handle all that, sit down for an hour, and focus. So also, you guys have a task. Everybody in the audience, I want you to keep task of uh, tally of how many times you get distracted. Be honest with me. I won't be offended, I promise. <laughs> Who is Alexandria Allen? I'm Alexandria Allen. <laughs> I am a product of trauma. Um, I'm going to go through my life and just tell you guys um, a little bit about everything. My first childhood memory, I'm not trying to dampen the mood, was the scene of my mom's best friend on her front porch after she was murdered by her husband. Four years old. That's my first memory. So that fear of just seeing that, of knowing that, knowing that somebody who loved you could take you off this earth 
That was the first thing I learned about love. That confused me. That did a lot to me. That had me in a constant fight or flight. That also affected my mother. <clears throat> From that point, I saw her change a lot. My mother is was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, um, bipolar disorder, anxiety. She had arachnophobia. She couldn't come outside. Now we find out it all stemmed from trauma. Those were labels that they like to put on it, but it was all trauma. She had been through a lot when she was a little girl, just like myself, and that's how she was dealing with it. She was self-coping, with um, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol. And that, that really affected me a lot. She wasn't there for me. And I don't blame her now. I've learned to forgive her. She couldn't be there for me. So in those early years where your mother is feeding you and when you're crying, you're getting picked up and you're getting comfort, I didn't have that. I didn't learn that that's how you, somebody's supposed to be there to console you. I was constantly consoling myself. And this really affected my self-esteem. Everyone believes that your self-esteem is within yourself. But what people really don't realize is your self-esteem is instilled in you from birth from your caregivers. So if your caregivers are telling you over and over again, you're not going to be anything, you are not going to amount to anything, no matter how much self-esteem you have, it's going to begin to break you. And if you're not given those caring parents that tell you you're special, this, you're not, you begin to not believe it. And you begin to act accordingly. So when we get to elementary school, moved around, I was homeless. I don't know if they still do this, but in Springfield, when I went to Springfield, they followed you home to make sure you lived in Springfield. Um, so they followed us home. I got kicked out. We did not live in Springfield. We lived in Philadelphia, but my mom wanted me to go to a better school district, and my grandparents lived in Springfield. So it was a lot of back and forth for me, confusion. Where did I live? I was homeless for a lot of these years in elementary school. We lived in a car, or a lot of my family members didn't want to deal with my mom. And since I was in her custody, they couldn't really take me. So they both got to go. And they didn't care where we went because they were tired of dealing with it. And that inconsistency and that homelessness really struck my self-worth as well because I felt like I began to think, and when you're at that young age, you can't think, oh, we're homeless because my mom can't keep a job because she's bipolar. No, you take it on yourself. You say we're homeless because something's wrong with me when you're at that age or we just don't deserve it. You begin to really reflect as if there is something wrong with you. So elementary school was, it was hectic. It was really hectic. And my mom dealt with drug issues. Um, I didn't really become aware of it until recently, but she was an alcoholic. She was mentally and physically abusive. Um, she would drink and she would just uh, tell me how She'd be like, don't call me mom. My name is Arden. That was her favorite. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't have a mom anymore. Just because I did something she didn't like. And at that time, I didn't understand. I thought I was a bad kid. I didn't know what bipolar disorder was in elementary school. What is that like? What are you telling me? I took that personal. We moved. And elementary school, I went to Springfield for like three weeks, second grade. Um, a little bit of third grade and fourth grade. I went to like six different elementary schools. So my learning was, it got impa impacted from that. Because if I'm going from this school district, they have a whole different, they're going on a different curriculum than when I transfer over here and they're doing something totally different. But nobody was trying to catch me up. So by the time I got to like middle school and high school, I was like the lead. I was in special education, that kind of stuff. Middle school years, Fifth grade, my father died from AIDS. Worst, one of the worst experiences I had because when I can say he was the most stable person I had in my life, it hurt me. I didn't understand. That's when I began to question life. Like, the one good parent I got, you gonna take it? What is going on here? Then again, my self-esteem got impacted. Oh, I must not deserve parents. Cause once again, when you're in middle school, at these ages, your brain is not fully developed. You, you can't fully process this happened because of this, this, and that. 
It's that you process it internally. And those internal feelings make you act out externally. So middle school, um, still live with my mom. We actually lived over by Philmont, across the street. She was even more, uh, she was physically abusive at those times. Um, I never knew what was going on. I never knew what I was gonna come home to. School was my outlet. I liked school just because it wasn't, and I hate this word, it wasn't crazy stuff going on at school. I could be free. I, could, I didn't have to worry about, is my mom gonna beat on me, hit on me? Like, what is gonna be next? And mind you, this is all happening in Springfield Township, the township that we live in, where a lot of us think that this stuff doesn't happen, I guess, because we're in Springfield. But it happens. We're living in Philmont. Then my mom, this is the last time I lived with my mom. Um, actually, seventh grade, I had to live with my best friend. The most embarrassing thing ever. Oh. You would think it made me happy, but at that age, I was just sitting there like, why can't I have that family? Why do I have to be like a orphan? Like, why do I have to live with my friends? Mind you, my grandma lived around the corner. She didn't want me to live there. I said, Phew. and I'm not, I wasn't bad. I stayed out late one night. She didn't want me to come back. So that was embarrassing. I was supposed to move to West Philly after that, but my grandma fought for me to finally fought for me to move in with her. Um, my mother, we just parted ways after middle school. She stopped paying the rent one day and left me there for the sheriff to show up and knew he was coming. But that's just how she handled things. She ran from things. I saw that my mom thought I was a mini adult. And I think that's what a lot of adults, we have that problem. Even me sometimes. I talk to Diane like she's a mini adult sometimes. Then I have to snap back into it like, they're kids. Your brain isn't even fully developed until you're 25 years old. They're kids. They're not many adults. So I was, a lot of times in middle school years, I was her parent. I was taking care of her. And this affected me greatly. I couldn't be a kid. I was my mom's mom. And then my dad died. Everything just went down. But by eighth grade, I moved in with my grandparents. Um, Things started to get a little better. My pop-up is, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm biracial. I come from <laughs> black and white. I'm black and white. My mom is white and my dad is black. When I first moved into my grandfather's house, my grandfather was racist. So once again, I'm walking into an environment where I'm not welcome. I'm not wanted, at least I feel like it. Because I'm half black. What's that got to do with anything? I didn't understand. I said, what does that have to do with anything? First of all, Honestly, sometimes you can't even tell. I'm looking at myself, like, why are you hating on me because of my skin complexion? Because of, and it hurt even more because it was my grandfather. <laughs> You're supposed to love me, no, no matter what. So a lot of the, when I moved in with them, it was just me and him going back and forth. So when I finally saw my outlet, I was like, oh, I'm moving, moving with my grandparents' house. I'm gonna be able to be a kid. No, we just butt heads. Just dealing with racism within my own home which killed me because I don't, I didn't understand it at that age. So in between all this, my behaviors were all over the place in school. I would cry all the, I would cry all the time. We're, Mr. T not here yet? I would walk, run into Mr. T's class at least three times a week crying. I got in a fight several times and I'm little. Please don't judge me. I, I, I try to be as transparent, but I've gotten into like three fights at school and high school. I'm not that person anymore. I promise. And I wanted to hurt people. You want to know why? Because I was hurt. I was very hurt. I didn't have parents. I struggled. And all this made me act out in school. And instead of... And I don't... I don't want this to sound like I'm blaming Springfield, but I would miss weeks of school. I don't know how anybody didn't call the house, social workers, huh? I would meet, miss all these <coughs> opportunities 
And I didn't know how anybody didn't notice. Everybody just wanted to say I was being bad. There's no bad kids in the world. Sorry, y'all. There's no bad kids in this world. You want to say that they're bad, but I never met a kid that acted out and didn't have something going on. And I am now a therapist. I don't know if I said that. I'm a therapist. I'm a social worker. I work with adolescents. I've never met a kid that was just running around acting all this stuff and he wasn't getting abused at home or more than things going on at home. So I ask anybody in here that really works with kids, let my life story let you know that the way I was acting was because of everything I was going through. And that exercise that we did in the beginning, that's how these kids' minds are going. They're thinking about so many things. And you want them to sit there for 45 minutes and look at this board? When most of them haven't even had breakfast. And I know when I'm hungry as an adult, I can't focus. So why are we asking kids whose brains are developed even least than, less than ours? to do something that we can't even do. And trust me, I know it gets frustrating. I've had bad, a bad kid that just wanted to be, this was bad all over again, over and over and over again. I wanted to get frustrated, but as an adult, I had to remember, no. There's some, it's something going on. It's something going on. I don't care how frustrated you get, please remember there's something going on with that child. Um. High school. High school got a little better. I met my mentor. A man, he's not in here. Mr. Thompson, <laughs> Leonard Thompson. Oh my God. So I'm, I told you guys I loved my dad. He was like <clears throat> my favorite person in the world. So coming up in Springfield, I didn't see a lot of black men around me. Mr. T was, my dad died when I was in fifth grade. Mr. T was the first black man really in Springfield that I saw by 10th grade. Fifth to 10th grade, I didn't really see that many black men in Springfield where I could feel comfortable to relate to him. So when I saw him, I said, oh my God, I used to be able to talk to my dad. I could go to Mr. T. And he would open his doors. And that's when I really re realized how important mentoring and supports were. I wasn't able to really be successful before then because I didn't have supports. I didn't have the people around. around. Now, people can go through these things and still be successful, but a lot of people that go through th these things and are successful is because they have a lot of support around them. They have a lot of understanding around them. Um, so, once I met Mr. T, it changed my life. He let me know that I could do anything, that I could be anything. And he prepped me for this moment right here, which is crazy. Never could I, would I have ever imagined that I would be back here working with Mr. T. So when I tell you that anything is possible, and this is for, for y'all, when I tell you anything is possible, anything, I'm not supposed to be here. Statistics show that my mom graduated from alternative high school. My dad didn't even make it past middle school. I'm about to graduate with my master's degree. Statistics show that I'm not supposed to do that. Statistics show that I'm supposed to be on crack, pregnant, I don't have no kids. So when I tell you, don't ever let a statistic tell you that you need to be a statistic. Because you don't. You just have to know your worth. And that's why I created this, Worthy Lifestyle. Um, college years, I'm getting kind of off track. I struggled with, I isolated myself. I started to get depressed. Stuff started to catch up. Because when you're kids, you're resilient. And I don't want to say this to ever make y'all think that it's going to get harder. But when you're younger, you're more resilient. So I had that fight in me. I was like Tyson. like. I had the fight in me, but once I got to college, I started to be like, I was ready to bite somebody's ear off. Like, <laughs> I was getting depressed. Like, it was, I was starting to feel like an adult. I was getting wear down. It was more years. I was wearing down. I was like, I can't, I don't got that fight in me anymore. Isolated, I got depressed. Crazy depressed. Crazy, crazy depressed. I didn't go out. I just did my homework. And that's bad for you. Don't isolate. If you begin to feel like you want to isolate, Call me. You all got my phone. And anybody in here that needs my phone or this, you will be able to call me. Um, so then I went on, what happened? I saw a quote to my freshman year. Love like you've never been hurt before. Smile like you've never felt pain before. And it hit me. I said, 
My mom self sabotaged herself because of her past. My mom was one of the best hairdressers in Philadelphia. She could have been amazing. But because of everything she went through, she self destructed. My father, one of the best chefs in the world, <clears throat> actually, they were fighting between like Hawaii, Japan. His mom died when he was 20. His dad left him. And he began to drink. Self sabotage. So once I saw that quote, I vowed to, vow to myself, I will not be my parents. I will not let the past determine my future. I will only let it make me better, make me build something. And that's what I built. <laughs> I'm new to this, y'all. That's, yeah, that's the right one. I built Worthy Lifestyle. Worthy Lifestyle was a mobile application. I am a therapist. So what I first did was like try to do the traditional therapy, but I didn't like it because I couldn't help enough people. I want to save the world. I'm, I'm that person. So I wanted to create something that could go to the masses. So it's a human empowerment mobile application that was created to provide support, mental health education, to enhance the quality of life. Basically a gym for the mind. <coughs> Y'all want to work out your bodies. People want to be vegans now. But nobody wants to take care of their mind. And that's where it all starts. If my mind's not right, I can't work out right. I can't eat right. I can't build anything or be an entrepreneur. I can't do anything. Um, what this has turned into, so basically on the app, uh, we have like cooking videos. We've got blogs. We've got support groups. We've got workout videos. Daily quotes. Daily quotes that will be getting fixed. Daily quotes. Um, inspirational videos. Everything you need to just be the best version of you. Because it's hard nowadays to be the best version of you. When we have so much, excuse my language, shit going on. Just thrown at you. So that's why I wanted to create that. I wanted to create something where you could go on every day, you know, meditate, take care of yourself. If you're not taking care of yourself, of your mind is going to catch up sooner or later. It's going to be bad, bad. Um, it turned into the Worthy Lifestyle Girls Group, and we'll be starting the Junior Girls Group soon. Woo -woo. Um, and like I said, I'm hoping to take over the world. If people tell you you can't take over the world, you think they said that tomorrow? Lucy or Harriet tell me? I hate when people say you can't save the world. Yes, I can. Don't tell me what I can't do. <laughs> And what I want to do is just continue to provide support and help create strong and mentally healthy leaders. I think when people talk about mental illness, they automatically just think depression and bipolar. No, mental health means exactly that. Keeping this healthy. Nobody wants to go see a therapist. But how, many, how often you guys go see a doctor? Probably at least once a year. Why are we not taking care of this? The mind. The most important part of the body, to me. <laughs> Worthy lifestyle. If you go on to <coughs> Google Play or the App Store, this is what it looks like. Ooh, I did it again. I'm not good at this. That's what it looks like. Feel free to download it. <laughs> and it's free. And then, sorry. This is all my contact information. And like I said, if you want my phone number, just come up to me personally. I'll give it to anybody. But I just didn't want it all on the side. So, okay, so my first question is, who got distracted? Be honest, nobody? Really, I'm that good? <laughs> Thank you, okay. Thank you, sir. You guys are grown people, right? So how can we, my point of that is, how can we expect students to stay focused? I be in these all the time. We have to, and, and just to reiterate what my point was, the whole point is, is just please have more patience with these kids and these students because you never know what's going on. And if they're acting up, just what's going on? If they don't want to talk to you, find somebody that they might want to talk to. I'm going to be available throughout this whole school district. That's my goal at all times so that I can be here for these kids because what I realized is once I met Mr. T, it all changed. So I want to be Mr. T to as many kids as I can. And that's my goal. 
So thank you for listening to my story. Thank you everybody for coming out. And I hope you guys have a great night. Of course, yes. Does anyone yes. have any questions for Alan? I mean, she took your breath away. I know yeah. you have to kind of get your composure back. With an no. Amazing story. Anybody? She's telling me my lips is chapped. <laughs> when I get nervous, my mouth starts to get parched. And your lips. We warm. have a question. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, first and foremost, for sharing your story. Of course. I know it took a lot of courage and. I appreciate it hearing it. One of the things that stood out to me, I heard you as you got to high school, you discovered Mr. Mr. T, who was your mentor, and has opened up doors for you. But I, I think, as I want to ask if you could look back when you were in elementary school or middle school, have you been able to think about what you possibly needed at that point in time in your life to be able to gain the access and the belief in yourself that you gained when you were in high school? So. Could you could something have been offered to you sooner, or was that seeing me maybe seeing more people than I, I felt comfortable? This is no offense to anybody, but I've had I feel because of my father I feel more comfortable with African Americans with that one side of me. Um, so because of Mr. T, I felt like I correlated with my father. So maybe seeing more people that are like me, or Supports. I didn't know who the social worker was in elementary school. I think that person should be introduced to every student. I should be able to come to her and know what she does. Because in elementary school, we don't know what a, I didn't know what a social worker was until high school. So I think just educating them about the resources that are available. If you need this, we're here. Um, maybe having like little groups. I don't know if you guys have like emotional emotion support groups, stuff like that. Play therapy. <laughs> yes, Tony. For me, you are my mentor. Oh, thank and you. And I don't go through a lot of things, but when I do go through a lot of things, Alex is the person that I go to. I am a very blunt, honest, person. I voice my opinion all the time. I have no problem telling you anything that you need to know. And sometimes I think that I am too blunt and too honest and that might hurt somebody's feelings. But when I do, I go to Alex because she is somebody who has the same mentor that I had before I had her, which is Mr. Leonard Thompson. He has been the most honest person to me and she is the second him to me because when I don't like when I hear from Mr. Thompson or I don't like the stuff that he told me I go to her and they wind up saying the same thing <laughs> Stuck. so I think that her telling her story to all of us tonight was very beneficial because it's hard to open up to certain things like that she is a grown woman but grown people face face hard things with telling their life story. Mm -hmm. So for her to come up here and say all the stuff that she had going on with her father and her parents, that she's a very open person with her work, her group worthy lifestyle in the high school. But at the same time, there's nothing that we don't know about her. That whole story she just told y'all, I heard that two times over because I've been a part of her group for two years. The messages she sends out on her group and her um, app, I could have a bad day that day, and that message gets sent to my phone. I always got my phone on. <laughs> that message gets sent to my phone, and I'm sad, and I look at it, and I be like, this just made my day better because I wasn't feeling too good about myself. And it's just, she's so great. When Mr. T brought her to the school, it was such a blessing to <clears throat> us and the other girls that are part of this group. And I just would like to say that she is Yet again, so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Danny, you're, you're passing that on to the middle school, too. Yes, right? we are starting so. a junior worthy lifestyle dedicated from me and, and her. And you're good friends. It's and from you. Yes, yes. Because of how much she helped me. 
and how much I want to help the girls in the middle school that I would that wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. Paying so, it forward, it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And eventually plan to bring it to the elementary school and to the infield. What do you say to the people who, like me, I grew up in Springfield, but the picture of Springfield that most people have, the white affluent area, you know, went to college and mm -hmm. came back and I'm teaching in the district. And I, I have students that you speak of that have the history. And um, we talk about empathy in our Spartan Pride time all the time. Um, but how do you, what do you say as advice to someone who maybe hasn't experienced as much of the trauma that these students that I have to put on a good face for and you know make sure they're happy and loved? Like what is, what is your advice to someone who hasn't necessarily gone through that so that they can best serve those students? Like I don't have your experience, but right. I want to, I want to understand your experience so that I can then address you and make you as ready to learn and loved and cared for as you possibly can feel? I think the biggest thing is education and psychoeducation. So it's basically learning more about trauma and how it affects the brain. I've recently just learned about trauma and how it affects the brain. So it's really, and hopefully, and that's one of the things I do want to do is that we continue these where I can talk to teachers about trauma, how it affects the brain. So I would say seminars, just continue to educate. I want to give you my contact information. We could just throw ideas back and forth. You can even email me. I'm having this with this student. Um, those students really need to talk. If they don't feel comfortable talking to you, finding somebody they may feel comfortable talking to. And don't take it personal if they don't. They want to talk to somebody they feel has been there before. That was always my thing. So just continuing to, um, are you in the middle school? Elementary, fifth grade. Elementary. I was going to say, well, hopefully we'll be there soon. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to be working on that. But just continuing to educate yourself about the brain and just how it's developed and how when you do experience that trauma, your brain is rewired and a lot of that trauma is stuck in the brain. So if something might occur that might be similar, like even sitting a certain way. Like, I don't know if you guys ever know of PTSD, but they say a lot of army vets, like if they sit a certain way that they might have been sitting on a tank, on the tank or something to trigger them. You see here, right here, lean up a little bit, and that'd be the exact position that they were in. They're going right back there and they're spazzing out. I hate using that word. Uh, you know, having a lot of emotions. <laughs> so it's just about really educating yourself on that because it's hard to understand when you haven't been through it. But um, when you've gone through a lot of trauma, you have really no control over your brain until you learn how to have control. So that's why I say there's no, in my eyes, there's no bad kids. They're all dealing with just a lot of stuff. And I know some people didn't hear that, but there's no bad kids. So just make sure I get your contact information. And I'll send you more stuff, because like I'm still in school. So anything I have, send it your way. I promise it won't be like 15 pages. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So if you'll indulge me for a few moments, I'd like to follow up on what Alex spoke about this evening. And this just came to me actually this week as the result of a story that I saw on 60 Minutes on Sunday evening. Did anyone happen to see that segment on Ryan Speedo Green? So let me share with you, and I'm going to read some of it from online because it will resonate with you based on what you just heard. And the stories are unfortunately very, very similar, but the good news is, like Alex, Ryan has become extraordinarily oh. successful. So I want to share this with you. And again, pardon me for reading most of it. As a 12-year-old in Virginia, Ryan Speedo, and that's his real name, not a nickname, Ryan Speedo Green was the author of an impressive rap sheet. He was so violent, he was banished to a class for delinquents. And when he couldn't be contained there, he was sent to a juvenile lockup. Those who knew the boy with the unusual name could see that the child was writing a tragedy. Now, as a man, tragedy has become the dominant theme in his life but in a way that no one could have imagined. 
The high priest in the temple of the Metropolitan Opera in New York City is Ryan Speedo Green, starring in one of Rossini's operas. Green blessed the hall with a voice that reaches from bass to baritone. At age 32, he's a member of the Vienna State Opera and performs on stages of the world in German, French, English, and Italian. Some call his sound a gift, but that sells short the life of struggle and the sacrifices of others that lifted him to the high altar of success. So in Green's own words, and some of this I think will resonate with you, Colin, based on your question, he says he lived in a trailer park and then he lived in other low-income housing where there was a crack house next door to him that produced drugs for the city. He lived at home with his mother and an older brother. He had a lot of issues, he says, and a lot of anger problems, a lot of explosions of anger and frustration that was going on in his life. It was hard for the interviewer to envision explosions of <coughs> anger in this very gentle giant who was sitting in front of him. But 20 years before, Green and his brother were being raised by an abusive mother and he returned that abuse. Too violent for fourth grade, he was banished to a class for delinquents. His first day of class, he walked in, and he's an African American, and he says there was a little five foot one inch Caucasian, curly blonde haired lady. And I sat down in my chair and I threw my desk at her. And I told her, I will not be taught by a white woman. And instead of kicking me out of class, like most teachers would do, and you'd be justified in doing so, she instead took away my chair, and she said I could learn from the floor. And when I'm ready to not throw my desk at someone, I could have my desk and my chair back. That was teacher Elizabeth Hughes. Green goes on. After being asked, why would Mrs. Hughes figure you for somebody who had a future? He says, I don't think it was specific to me. I believe she thought this way about every student that she worked with. Instead of sending me home and throwing down the hammer on judgment, she asked me, is everything okay at home? What's wrong with you? Why are you so angry? School then became a haven, but the fights at home continued. And one day, Speedo Green pulled a knife and threatened his mother and his brother. And when the police came to the home, they didn't feel it was safe for him to be around his family. And so they took him to juvenile detention. He walked down three flights of stairs in shackles and handcuffs into the back of a police car and they drove about four hours to where the juvenile detention facility was, and he remembers feeling alone. He was locked up for two months. The only sound that penetrated those walls for him was him thinking about Mrs. Hughes and her teaching in fourth grade. And he remembers then getting a phone <clears throat> call, and it was Mrs. Hughes calling the juvenile detention facility. And she said to him, don't let this moment define you. This does not define you. You can do better. She found out that he had been there and she called. And that precipitated one of his biggest outbursts because he felt so ashamed and so angry for letting her down, the one person that really cared about him that he had one of the biggest outbursts at the juvenile detention facility, and so they ended up putting him in solitary confinement again and again and again. He was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer says, and what about when the door to the isolation cell closed for the first time because they put him in isolation? He <clears> said, I remember just banging on the door and screaming. I was looking for anybody and anything that could connect me to the outside world. 
You know, the energy of a child, the anger of a child screaming and screaming and screaming and screaming until it gets so unbearable you just fall on your knees and start crying. And what did you think about that? The interviewer asked. Being in that cell was the lowest point in my entire life. And when I actually got out of there, that was my motivation to never, ever end up in a place like that. No one was listening to the voice locked in solitary except for the few who would save his life. Mrs. Hughes, the teacher, who happened to be too camera shy for an interview, and in detention, a social worker by the name of Priscilla Pinheiro Jenkins. Priscilla said this kid was small, angry, and full of just hate. This eloquent man that is sitting here next to me is not who I first met. Every other word out of his mouth was foul. Every other word was negative. There was nothing positive coming out of him. Ryan admits, I called her awful names like and a Hawaiian bitch or something like that. And she says, uh-huh. And he says, I remember that despite all my anger, despite all my outbursts, she was still nice to me. I still remember that, that this was a person who was nice to me, a person who showed me kindness. And that's an amazing feeling to see that in darkness. And the interviewer says, this kid who called you a Hawaiian bitch, she's speaking to Priscilla, why didn't you just say, hey, I don't care what happens to you? And she says, he's a child. It's not at me. You can't just say no to someone and shut them out when you know they're desperate to figure out what is love? Who will love me? Who will care for me? Will you stand by me even if I'm cussing you out? And she said, the answer is yes. So the interviewer asked, he just had to know that somebody gave a damn? And she says, exactly. And he was listening. And that is how the world came to listen. His life was saved by a few compassionate adults. Mrs. Hughes, Priscilla Pinheiro Jenkins, and a psychiatrist provided by the state of Virginia. Coming out of detention, Green got a fresh start. His family moved to a new town with a new school and new friends. And he started realizing that kids were involved with after-school activities. From the Latin club that I joined, to chorus that I joined, to football that I joined. So I had no time to argue with my mom because I was thinking about studying for a Latin quiz bowl or I was in my room playing with my keyboard trying to memorize music for my chorus concert the next day. Chorus had been suggested by his football coach who thought it would be easy, but it wasn't. But his singing improved so much, he was accepted into Virginia's prestigious Governor's School for the Arts. And then at the age of 15, a field trip brought him to New York City and the Metropolitan Opera. And it was watching the opera, the opera Carmen, starring Denise Graves, an African-American woman who was in the title role. And Ryan says, at that point in my life, I thought opera was, well, you know, for white people. And the lead character, the title role, was a person who looked like me, a person of color. It completely shattered my preconceptions of what I thought opera was. The star, Denise Grave, seduced a soldier on stage and Speedo in the audience. He says, I fell in love with opera that day, and I left the Metropolitan Opera, and I told my voice teacher, now I know what I want to do with my life. I want to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. And instead of saying, no, you can't do that, or maybe you should aim a little bit lower, or maybe of saying all these ifs and ands and buts, he told me a list of many things I had to do. I had to graduate high school. I had to go to college for music. I had to learn to sing in foreign languages. I had to do dozens of things before I could even audition for the Met. So he checked off the entire list including a bachelor and a master's degree in music. 
At the age of 24, he entered a Metropolitan Opera competition for young singers, and he beat more than a thousand other contestants. He says his father was an amateur bodybuilder and he wanted to name me after himself. But my mother was like, no, he can't be named Cecil. So he named me Speedo after his favorite bathing suit, which also <laughs> happened to be his middle name. And that's how I got the name Speedo. So he goes on and on and he says, I want for people to think of me as an opera singer, not just a black opera singer. And he says, I'll come out of this performance of completely German music and there'll be an older Caucasian person who'll come up to me and be like, I'd love to hear you sing Old Man River. <laughs> Old Man River, in case you may not be aware of this, is a show-stopping song from a hit show many, many years ago from Showboat sung by a man by the name of Paul Robeson, who hopefully all of you know who that is. He says, every time I sing, there's going to be somebody in the audience who's going to see me as Joe and Showboat instead of seeing me as Ryan Speedo Green, the bass, baritone, classical music opera singer. The irony of it is Joe's singing this piece about the hardships of post-slavery and about the hardships that Caucasian people are causing him. Yet the people who love the song the most are Caucasian people. And then he invites everybody up on stage to hear him sing. There are no microphones in opera, so his voice has to fire over a 60-piece orchestra and ricochet off the back of the music hall. And he says, I am the voice of the Father. I'm the voice of the person you hear before you go to bed. I'm the voice of gods, of demons, of the guy who kills the tenor. His audience often includes Elizabeth Hughes, his fourth grade teacher, and his mother with whom he's reconciled. He travels with his new wife and their new son. And because he's only 32 years old, his voice will continue to mature. <coughs> so finally, the interviewer asks him, if you could speak to the kid sitting in solitary, what will you tell him? And he says, I would tell him there are trees and sun beyond these walls. Don't let this moment define you. In the words of Elizabeth Hughes, don't let this moment define you. This is not the end. This is only a moment in time. And someday it'll get better. Someday things will get brighter. So Colin, that's the job that you and me and all of us in this room have, is to let our kids know we're not going to let those horrible moments define who you are. We're going to help you get through, and we're going to give you the supports you need. So thank you, everybody, for listening to thank you. Alexandra's wonderful story and for allowing me to share this. I was just so inspired by this as well as your story. And I thought they really fit so nicely together. I'm telling you I'm a first grade teacher at Enfield. And my background is similar to yours with addiction, with my parents and things. But what I par what parents who are in this room to know is that dealing with children who are going through trauma and displacement, a lot of times we have to step back and not judge. And when we're in those meetings, those delicate meetings with the social worker and the parent, sometimes it's just easier. I mean, it's, it's hard, I guess, but for you to imagine what that adult is going through at the time. Because if somebody had reached out to my mom when those things were happening, they could have had a rapport and maybe she didn't, wouldn't have gone down the road that she went down. But I know that it's, as a teacher, we have to look at the relationship not only with the child, but also with that parent who might be struggling. And it takes a lot of time. It takes, you know, after school work or you know, that kind of thing, but I just recall two years ago that I had a parent like that. I'm sorry, I'm shaking, but um, I had a parent like that, and I just, I know you can't have too much empathy because they are struggling, but you still need to, like, take yourself out of your box and say, well, hmm, did she have a hard day? Did somebody trigger her? You know? All the time. Yeah. That's what I do all the time. I, I never try to assume. I think as humans, we just try to assume all the time. Like, oh, this person is doing this because of this. Because our brain just yeah. needs answers. But it's about asking. 
And it's about really realizing that there's probably so many things going on. Yeah. I never blame the parents because once a lot of these behaviors are uh, taught or learned generations, generations, generations back. I don't blame right. the parents. It's just that, like you said, we do need to connect to help the parents as well. So the I, whole unit. We have great. Well, we have a great social worker, Miss Joanna Dar, here, and she. Oh man. She is out of this world. And it's just really nice to get ideas from her to help me broach a particular situation right. that, you know, I might not have seen it that way. So to parents who are out here, we do, um, they're, the resources that we have, we just, we, you know, we just really need to tap into them a lot more and just put them in like our repertoire. Like I can hit her for this, maybe she can give me that information. Know, or that way to approach something. So, but thanks for sharing your story. Oh, no I was there with you on a couple of situations. <laughs> we wanted to talk, and not to like try to market my app. But if you ever have a parent, I have support groups on there for single parents, parents, okay. depression. <coughs> Let them know that that resource is out there. I have articles on there. What to do when you get stressed out and your kids doing this, you know, or if they can't get to the gym, I have workout videos on there for. I've got recipe ideas if they tired, you know. Let them know that that's out there for them too. Because that's what I build it for. Because a lot of us, we don't have the resources to be a therapist or to go to a therapist is very expensive. <clears throat> and a lot of us want to be our own therapist. I used to tell myself that I'm my own therapist. So what I, I created Worthy Lifestyle to kind of give you the tools to be an effective, your own therapist, <laughs> doing it right. <laughs> but thank you. And I want to talk to you a little bit later before you show. Anyone else have anything for Alex? Well, Alice, we just want to thank you so much again for coming and for sharing your wisdom and your story with all of us. It was really such an incredibly compelling story and so inspiring to all of us. And the work you done, you've done, obviously, not only has been successful, but look what you've got here. You've got such incredible support for who you are you and the work you're doing with our students. Denea, did you? Before you all leave from VOE, I have Nina Ivy here to talk about the, uh, the Civil Rights Symposium. <laughs> Sorry to hold y'all up real quick. My name is Nina Ivy from VOE, and one of our goals this year is to start a Civil Rights Symposium sometime in February. But to get started, we're asking people around if you know any family that was actually in the Civil Rights Movement. We want somebody who's like firsthand, like, you know, who was actually in it. We want at least, yeah, <laughs> like about, you know, we try and get as many people as possible, like 10 to 15, but you know, it's, we're limited. Uh, yeah, contact anybody in VOE if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, we just need people to talk for our school. Or Mr. T. Yeah. yeah. So I can offer someone up for you. Um, my husband, um, his, mother was a cousin of a woman in New York by the name of Carolyn Goodman and her son Andrew Goodman was one of three freedom riders in the south who was murdered by the KKK in Mississippi their bodies were thrown on the side of the road after they were murdered so that's my husband's direct cousin so I'll be happy to put him in touch with all of you so he can share memories of Carolyn and, and Andrew yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night. Okay, great, great. And that wonderful activity that you guys are going to be involved in. Um, so at this point, um, what we're going to do is break into our subcommittee groups. I know there's been a lot of work going on. Please feel free if you have not been a part of a group in the past, if you'd like to join up. Um, we have one group devoted to examining academic performance issues, and that is Mr. Fuller and Dr. Rittenhouse, who are here this evening. Ms. Davis couldn't be here. Um, we have a group that is looking at recruiting and hiring practices within the district with the idea of trying to recruit and hire a more diverse staff for our students. That's Emily Kerr. 
along with Jason Payne. We have a group looking at professional development. Um, you know, Alex spoke a lot about trauma-informed instruction. That's one of the areas we're looking at, along with many others. That's going to be Mr. Scragan. He's with Mrs. Van Boren, who unfortunately could not be here this evening. We have a group devoted to examining diverse issues when it comes to student life and student engagement. So student life is Mr. McLaurin and Mr. LaRocco. And then we have community engagement that um, is also examining issues of diversity and that's with Dr. Johnston and who else? Okay. And Katie Braun, our assistant business manager. And Megan, you're with Dr. Yana Cohn, who could not stay. She had an emergency, unfortunately. But they're examining diversity issues in our curricular program and in our courses of studies, which is a very hot topic, of course. So if you would like to stay and join in in the conversation in any of the groups, I've asked the people in charge of those committees to work with you to develop some measurable outcomes so that as our work continues over the course of the year, we want to be able to look back and say, were we able to accomplish things? You know, what were the goals that we set for ourselves? How has the work progressed so that we know that whatever goals we set forth, we were able to really determine, yes, we're able to meet those goals and we're making strides and we're making improvements. So um, please find the group leader um, for the subcommittee that you'd like to be involved with. And thank you again, everybody, so much for coming. It's great to see all of you.